We know that our colleagues across the aisle are desperate to find some actual evidence of wrongdoing to justify their failed impeachment inquiry. But even under these desperate circumstances, I am still shocked and disappointed that you have targeted someone grieving from the horrific attack of October 7th for your impeachment investigation. Well, I'm somewhat fascinated by my colleague on the other side of the aisle talking about evidence that doesn't exist while I sat in a room during the last administration and they literally made up evidence to impeach a president, evidence that didn't exist or supported lies that do exist to impeach a president. And so his words fall a little hollow at this moment. The only thing that my colleague heard was about made up evidence as it relates to the former president, the twice impeached 91 indicted count former president who's currently sitting in a fraud trial, who's also been found liable of sexual assault. The only thing that he heard was this bit about made up evidence. And so he says, well, the Democrats didn't have the right to do what they did when they impeached the president. I disagree. And it looks like at least four grand juries feel like they've got some evidence or maybe that's made up as well. I come in this committee and just when I think I can't be shocked anymore, I get shocked to the next level. And I listened to Dan who, I was with him in Israel in August. And I listened to him tell very real stories of real issues that are taking place in this world right now, issues that we have been charged with the responsibility of being the adults in the room and trying to solve. Over the past couple of weeks, <clears throat> since October 7th, I have met with numerous families of hostages in Gaza who are searching for any information about their loved ones held in captivity. This is Abigail. Now, Abigail somehow got away and ran to Abichai's home, where she was also kidnapped with Abichai's wife and three children, and they all remain in captivity, at least we hope. Now, I've had the opportunity to meet a couple of times over the past few weeks with Elizabeth Naftali, Smadar's aunt and Abigail's great aunt. She is absolutely devastated with grief, fear, and worry about her little niece, Abigail. But what did the committee Republicans do last week with Ms. Naftali? They did not reach out to her to see how Congress could be of assistance to her as she grieves and waits for information about Abigail. No. Instead, the majority subpoenaed her. That's right. The chairman used the awesome power and authority of the United States Congress to target Ms. Naftali as part of his fishing expedition against Hunter Biden, allegedly because Ms. Naftali may have bought some art. As I listened to him, I thought, man, I was actually going to deal with what we're supposed to be talking about. And then, of course, I get a colleague from the other side of the aisle who could hear of the pain and suffering as Dan was telling the stories. And the only thing that he heard, because it's seemingly what happens in this chamber, is that there's a level of callousness and a lack of humanity. He says, well, the Democrats didn't have the right to do what they did when they impeached the president. I disagree. And it looks like at least four grand juries feel like they've got some evidence, or maybe that's made up as well. Or maybe once the convictions come down, which there will be a conviction in some territory, I say that with all confidence as someone who was practicing law for 17 years, I'm sure they will say that that was made up. I'm sure that they don't believe the co-defendants that have come out and pled guilty as it relates to the charges in Georgia, and I'm sure they think that that's made up. Just like they said that January 6th was made up after they ran for their lives. And I'm sure that they believe that the convictions that came out of January 6th, those were made up too. But let me tell you what's not made up as they live in their fairy tale world. What's not made up is that the government has a looming shutdown in three days and they decided to drag you in and talk about the job that you're not doing. And, and before I go into it, I do appreciate the work that you do, especially as a girl that grew up in St. Louis, Missouri, and fondly remembers the better days of Missouri when your father was the governor. 
So I will tell you what is not made up and what is real life. Number one, I want to recenter us on what it is your job is. Your job ain't got nothing to do with telework last time I checked. Is that true or not? That's correct. Okay, all right, because I don't know how the American people are going to get this straight when the members of Congress can't really figure out what your job is. So that's not your job. But you deal with a lot of real estate. So I just want to zone in on that because I don't have too much time left. But for those that don't understand, there's government leases. And most commercial leases go for more than a year, say, right? Yes. Yeah, usually more than maybe even two years, right? Yes. Usually a commercial lease is a very long-term lease, correct? And the price usually goes down the longer the term. Absolutely. Um, so. Typically, you're inclined to sign a longer lease, all right? But none of us saw COVID-19 happening. And while we are centered on talking about telework, it is really important that we zone in on something that you've said over and over and people are ignoring you. You said what makes it difficult for you to do your job is a lack of certainty. And this government shutdown this is the second one just this year that we're running up on. And we're kicking the can down the road because we're gonna run up on another one in January. It looks like we're gonna run up on two now, January and February, if they can get this passed. Can you please explain why a lack of certainty has a negative impact on you doing what you are charged to do for the American people? Yeah, thanks for that question. You know, real estate is, is a long-term thing. When you're buying a house or you're buying a piece of property, you don't just do that overnight. You have to plan your finances to make sure that it works. And when it comes to the federal government, it's not different. We have to have, particularly when we're maintaining buildings, we have to have a plan. We've got the biggest commercial real estate portfolio in the country. They're all in a different state of need, and we need to be able to have plans to address those things. Um, and the only way you do that is with some certainty. And, and not having clarity about what a budget's gonna be and kicking the can down to the road to the next year doesn't make the cost go down, it makes the cost go up. And so we've seen that happen over and over again because again of this lack of funding uh, of the Federal Buildings Fund. And you know what, to be clear, I remember when we had the first government shut down looming and we all have our own leases for our properties as well. I had to call my property manager and say, because the federal government can't get their stuff together just so you know, I may not be able to pay my bills and I hope you don't kick me out. That's not any way that we should be governing and talking about the fact that we are actually being fiscally responsible because it's just the opposite of it. Thank you so much for your dedication to this country. I really appreciate your time and for you putting up with the antics.